In 2016, historian Alison Weir released the first of six historical fiction books which covered the lives of the six wives of Henry VIII, from the event that took them out of childhood to the moment of their deaths and the many years in between. Except, of course, for Catherine Howard. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, another book series about the six wives? Hasn't that been done to death? Don't you make money by throwing shade at Philippa Gregory for doing the exact same thing? Well, yes, but there is a big difference. Philippa Gregory does historical fiction first, and some of her departures from historical fact, like Anne and George Boleyn actually going through with the incest, feels as though they're done only to stand out from the other novels and shock the reader. Meanwhile, Alison Weir is a renowned historian and factors as many facts and quotes into her fictional work as possible, and every time something strays from the truth, it is done conceivably within the limits of the world she has created, and within the characteristics of her heroines. This isn't Weir's first time writing fiction. She's also written novels about Elizabeth I, Lady Jane Grey and Eleanor of Aquitaine, among others. Weir's plan was to write six novels within six years, and some of these novels are huge. Like, take the first book in this series about Catherine of Aragon. The hardcover edition is nearly 700 pages long, and that's why I had to listen to this on Audible. Hashtag not sponsored. Yet. Spoilers ahead. Don't say I didn't warn you. The novel begins with Catherine's arrival in England after the long and stormy voyage from Spain and follows her throughout her life until her death in January 1536. Upon landing in the country she will be queen of one day, she is hit with the reality of potentially never seeing her mother again, which we readers know she won't, and severs her links with her Spanish childhood by anglicising her name from Catalina to Catherine. When she marries Prince Arthur, they can barely communicate, and it is clear that he is too ill to consummate their marriage. But at the same time, Arthur doesn't want to appear weak and unmanly, and Catherine overhears him telling his servants that he has spent the night in Spain, a quote which will later arise at the Ligatine court. Catherine isn't too attracted to Arthur, but she does feel sorry for him when she realises he's dying, and her belief that he already had tuberculosis when they married is confirmed. The interim years between Arthur's death and her marriage to Henry does tend to drag a bit, as we see over and over again how Henry VII does the bare minimum of providing for her, and how she is tricked into sending away her chief lady-in-waiting from the court, who has stood up for her for several years, and her situation is made worse. We don't see much of the future Henry VIII, as he is accurately kept away from public life as much as possible by his father, to the point that Henry's own rooms can only be accessed via the king's bedchamber. But it is nonetheless a relief when Henry shows up as the new king and proposes to Catherine. We share in her happiness at just being able to buy new clothes, as she had to wear the same morning dress after Arthur's, her mother's and Henry VII's deaths. As we're restricted to Catherine's point of view and we never see a single scene where she isn't present, there is an element of dramatic irony in there as she learns of the events at court and beyond, from the birth of Henry's illegitimate son Henry Fitzroy to Mary Tudor the Elder's secret marriage to Charles Brandon. One thing I like about books like these is seeing the first glimpses of people who will play a significant role much later down the line, but are dismissed as insignificant during their introduction. When Catherine sees Mary Boleyn, for example, leaving with her sister-in-law to France, Catherine can't possibly imagine that Henry will portray his wife with her. It's painful going through every single pregnancy complication that Catherine experienced. She doesn't even get to hold the short-lived son whom she and Henry pin so much hope on before he dies, and another pregnancy if some time later ends only a few hours after she tells Henry about it, thanks to a violently bumpy carriage ride and she is too numb to react to it. So it makes sense that her dedication to her living daughter Mary is so strong. Unfortunately, the limited perspective comes at the expense of fully realised foreshadowing and building up towards the King's great matter. The only proper scene between Catherine and Anne Boleyn is when Catherine finds her weeping because Wolsey has prevented her from marrying Henry Percy. The scene is also shown the other way around in the next book, but for that you'll have to wait. Catherine comforts her as she is empathetic to all those who need it, but the next time Anne is really of any significance is when Catherine sees the way Henry looks at her, and Catherine realises that she is the woman rumoured to be luring the king away from his wife. I would have liked to have had a few more scenes with them, where they might strike a bond over their mutual dislike of Wolsey. Perhaps Catherine talks to Henry on Anne's behalf to see if she can marry Percy. 
Henry, not knowing who Anne is, then starts to notice the sister of his former mistress. And BAM! Catherine indirectly causes Henry to start pursuing Anne Boleyn. That would be an interesting twist. The last chapters that cover Catherine's exile and decline in health is very upsetting, especially since you know there is no happy ending to this. She will never see Henry again, and she hasn't seen her daughter in years, but she remains in the hope that he will reach out to her at the last minute. It was why I had to listen to this on an audiobook, because I don't really enjoy depressing books now that I'm an adult and life is already depressing. When I was a teenager, I found beauty in tragedy, but now I don't find it romantic at all. I'm seeing a poor woman whose life was torn apart by the man she loved. Granted, it's not Weir's fault that Catherine's life was so tragic, and there was no way of avoiding this. Instead, this novel really goes into laying the ugliness of Catherine's history bare. There isn't anything poetic about what Catherine went through. She suffered because Henry's ego was so fragile, and he couldn't stand the idea of a woman succeeding him. From the beginning, Catherine is a long-suffering woman, a characteristic she sticks to until her last breath in the final chapter. But she also can't hold a grudge. When she hears that Anne Boleyn is at Hever Castle with the sweating sickness, Catherine realises her death would work in her favour, but at the same time knows it's pretty spiteful to want someone to die and simply detaches herself from the situation and lets the universe take its course. The novel religiously keeps to the real-life Catherine's personality of never letting her enemies see she's vulnerable. And when I was visualising Catherine, I constantly saw Annette Crosby's version from the BBC Six Wives of Henry VIII. Every moment Catherine is happy is a precious resource to her, as there are more tragic moments than uplifting. The perspective, as I said, is limited specifically within Catherine's mind, while told via third person. I always considered that this is probably the best way to write historical fiction from the perspective of a real figure, as it does seem a bit arrogant to assume the mind and speech of them by using first person. You could use first person if your narrator is fictional and happens to exist within the events of these people, but that's on a whole other level. Nevertheless, the novel shows why Catherine stuck to her principles when it would have been so much easier to give in and accept your retirement. Alan, don't you dare rustle that! Let the cat sit on a paper bag and he'll rustle the fuck out of it. After leaving her native Spain, having one husband die on her, spending years in limbo, then marrying a king who was frequently unfaithful, Catherine's religion was the only thing that kept her strong throughout. By lying that her marriage was consummated would mean severing that final link and she would forsake eternity in paradise for the comparably short-term gain of continuing to live in luxury. Her faith was all she had left at the end. And while her death scene doesn't have her going through the pearly gates, the fact she dies relieved to finally be at peace is itself a relief to the reader who will be left glad that her suffering is finally over. <laughs> As I've read five of the six books so far, I think it's safe to say that this is the best of the novels, and it gave me the inspiration to go forward with this YouTube channel when I first listened to it. As of this video, I finished the Catherine Howard novel last week, and once I read another novel, I'll move on to Catherine Parr. I doubt I'm going to get like 5,000 subscribers in the next two weeks, okay? <laughs> I think I can wait. If you're a die-hard history fan and looking for a more authentic novel about Tudor history to read, then by all means give it a look-see. But I should warn you, we will follow all the events possible in the novel's plot, and it is a very heavy read. The pacing is slow, but it's understandable as we're following over 35 years of history in 700 pages. I did listen to the 27 hour and 43 minute long audiobook while playing video games because I like to have something in the background while I do that. And maybe that's probably easier for people who just are intimidated by very big books. However, if you're not fond of depressing books with no happy endings, then this isn't for you. It's hard to listen to how Catherine is constantly screwed over and knowing there is no resolution to this. But history doesn't have a narrative that can be diluted into a neat package. Sometimes horrible people will get their just desserts, but usually that's not until hundreds, if not thousands or even millions have suffered as a result of their cruelty. Meanwhile, good people may die in obscurity and only be appreciated for their craft long after their deaths. 
History isn't pretty, and I feel that's the centre of this series of novels, which we will see in due course. So guys, thank you for watching the video. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be doing any sitting in front of the camera this month because my room is an absolute mess. Um, we're meant to be redecorating it this month, so, so it's like everything's like put away in boxes and I'm clear giving it a big clear out, so I can't exactly set up a nice thing, but once it's finished, I'm getting a bookcase corner, so I sit in front of not one, but two bookcases full of books and that's just going to be awesome. I always wanted a bookcase corner. I'd be very happy with a room that's just wall-to-wall -wall bookcases. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it and of course 2,000 subscribers. I cannot believe we got to this point. I was just like, what? Like, oh my god. I... It looks like um, we'll soon be on our way to 3,000 if we keep going and of course that's when I will review Alison Weir's Anne Boleyn novel. I was going to be a bit tricky because I think we differ on our opinion of Anne Boleyn, me and Alison Weir, but I still think it was pretty good. I mean, the Jane Seymour one is a bit of a chore, but again, audiobook, that's what audiobooks are for. Anna von Claver, bit odd, but I'm sure you'll like it. The Catherine Howard one was a bit... You know, I'll tell you what I think, think about the Catherine Howard one when we get to Catherine Howard, when we're at 6,000 subscribers. <laughs> And of course, Catherine Parr will be 7,000. And if we get to 8,000, I will do a redux of the Catherine of Aragon episode because I went back and watched it and oh my god, it is so... Cr I can't stop cringing. Like, I cannot believe how quickly I was talking. I, I can barely understand myself. I can't comprehend how anyone else can. But yeah, and of course, because I've left out a lot of stuff from from the Anne Boleyn rankings, then if we get to 9,000 subscribers, I will do a redux of Anne Boleyn's list and we'll add in like different versions. We'll add in the opera, we'll add in the 2021 version and Shakespeare this time, because I totally forgot about Shakespeare, but never mind. <laughs> and yeah, we'll give that another go. But for now, guys, thank you so much. And, and remember, if you want to support the channel, then you can head on over to my Patreon and you can pledge per video for a number of rewards and I am really looking forward to what we're going to do next. Okay, next time is Jane Seymour part three and we're going to power through because I know you guys really, really want me to get onto Catherine Howard. Like, I can feel your anticipation and I'd like to get to Catherine Howard too. <laughs> because I need to defend Emily Blunt's honour. Anyway, if you like the video, please give it a like, share and subscribe. And before I forget, here is my shout out to my VIP patron, Anastasia Gracia. Thank you, Anastasia. You are amazing.